coming sure. in. Hold on. See, I spoke too soon. <laughs> 15, 17, we will show up. Oh, oh come in as, as we go. Not a problem. <laughs> All right. So yeah, whenever whenever everyone's ready, I'm I'm ready to go. I'm gonna start by just making sure I can share my screen here. Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, this is Dr. Evan Murkoff, and he will be um, hosting tonight, uh, Beer 101, and I hope you enjoy it. Take it away. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we're recording, perfect. All right, so welcome. I'm glad everyone could join us. Uh, of course, this is Zoom, so I have to ask, can everyone see my screen? Is it full screen right now? Excellent. Okay, so uh, I, originally we were planning on doing this on campus and uh, it, the process of me, me showing you is gonna be a little different here because I don't have the ability to uh, you know, really bring out the different uh, parts of the, the brewing process, but I think I'll be able to give you a really good background, especially for, for people if you haven't brewed before, um, I should be able to give you a really good kind of uh, primer here as far as what home brewing is all about. So just to give you a little information about me, so I'm, a, I'm an associate professor at the Mount. I've been at the Mount for about six years. My research uses yeast, uh, the yeast that's actually very similar to brewing yeast, to study gene expression. But uh, I've actually been a home brewer longer than I've been studying yeast. I started brewing back in uh, 2006. So um, this is my, I can, let me get my little pointer going right here. Uh, this is my, my logo for my uh, company. Uh, I call myself Lazy Dog Brewer. And over the last 14 years, I've probably brewed somewhere in the order of a little over 200 beers. I've kind of lost count a little bit, but somewhere in that, that area. And uh, I've even entered some competitions. I've, I've won, a few, won a few ribbons. And uh, what I want to do is just give you a little background about what the process is, because I love doing it. I've been doing it for 14 years, and it's a, it's a really enjoyable hobby. Um, and before we start talking about it, I just want to give you some, some resources that you might be able to use uh, after the talk uh, when it comes to getting some more background on homebrewing. Uh, the, this, is, this is by far the best one. It's called How to Brew by John Palmer. John Palmer is one of the, the legends in the homebrewing field. And he wrote a pretty extensive book on homebrewing. And the first edition is free online. So you can read the entire book. Um, I actually read this book before I brewed my first beer, and it give, it, it's, it's probably more information than you need, but it'll give you a really good background on the process. Um, there's some really good message boards out there. The one that I uh, particularly like is called homebrewtalk.com. Uh, the people on there are really helpful. There's a lot of good advice. There's a lot of uh, good recipes. Um, I don't spend as much time on there as I used to, but if you see uh, Professor Frank, that's, that's me on there. There's some other websites. The BJCP website is the Beer Judges Certification Program. Uh, that'll tell you all about the different styles of beer. So as you're thinking about what you might want to brew, um, I don't usually recommend Reddit to people, but the homebrewing Reddit is actually really good. Um, homebrewers tend to be very collegial and helpful to each other. So there's go some good information there. And you can always reach out to me. I'm, I'm always happy to, to help uh, people who are interested in brewing. I've, I've brought a lot of people into this hobby. So I'm always happy to help people out. So in terms of what we're talking about today, uh, we're, we're talking about fermentation. And I'm not gonna go into all the different types of fermentation, but brewing beer is, is one of these. And the whole background of what brewing beer is, is starting with sugar, some type of sugar, which we'll talk about, and using yeast to convert that into ethanol and carbon dioxide. And that's the base of making beer. And we're talking about a process that has been around for a long, long time. Uh, there, there is evidence, uh, this, this is not completely updated, there's some evidence as, as far back as almost 10,000 BC that people were making some sort of beer type fermented beverage. So uh, back in uh, East Asia, we found evidence, uh, there's evidence in the Middle East from 3000 BC, there's evidence from uh, the North America from uh, hundreds of years ago. So this is something that's been around for a long time. There's actually some good research that suggests that the domestication of crops may have occurred because people wanted to make beer, the domestication of barley. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of uh, history, but the, the, the reason that beer has persisted over time is that it 
is actually quite good for you in a lot of ways, particularly if you go back to uh, you know, the 13th century, that time when there was not a lot of, of potable water. Turns out that beer is really safe. Um, so one thing that you can take away is if you decide to go make a beer, whatever you make, it's not gonna hurt you. Uh, nothing pathogenic can live in beer. Nothing that can, that can make you sick can live in beer. And the reason for that is one, it has a really low pH. Um, two, it has hops, which have natural antibiotic properties. And uh, the presence of alcohol make beer something that is very, something that you can store, something that doesn't really go bad. So before I talk about, I think I'm, I'm back, okay. Before I talk about the actual process, I just wanna go through the four main components of beer. So there are really just four ingredients that are necessary to make beer. There are other things that are sometimes added, and we can talk about some of those. And um, I'm, I'm gonna go through the ingredients, I'm gonna go through the process, but I do want people to ask questions. Um, I guess it's probably best if we save them uh, till the end, but uh, questions are probably the best way to, to learn. So as you, as you are watching, um, you know, jot down any questions that you might have, and I really wanna answer all of them. So the, the four ingredients in beer are simply grain, hops, water, and yeast. That's all you need. And most beers actually only contain those four things. Um, one interesting thing about the history of beer, um, a lot of the what we know of today's types of beers kind of came from Germany in about the, the 15th and 16th century. And in fact, there is a law in Germany that's still on the books called the German Purity Law, the Rheingottsblip. And that law says that you can only use barley, hops, and water. And the reason that it's only these three is that in the 1500s, this came out in uh, 1518, the reason the, for this is that they didn't know that yeast was actually what was uh, responsible for fermentation. So they've updated this law. Now you're allowed to add yeast, but most in most localities in Germany, you're actually only allowed to use these four, uh, these four ingredients to make beer. And in fact, when you're brewing, these are pretty much the only four things that you need. So let's talk about the first one, grain. Um, the, the type of grain that is most commonly used for brewing is, is what's called barley. Um, you've probably seen barley, uh, you, you, there are certain types of barley that you might eat, things like pearl barley. Um, there, is a, there is a type of barley that is grown specifically for brewing. It's called two row barley. And there are different, they, they're all the same type, they all start out the same type of, of grain. You can see these are all barley, except for this middle one here, this is wheat, but these are all barley kernels. They're, they're, they're about the, a little bit bigger than a grain of rice. And these are the base for beer. So the, the, most of the grains that you're gonna use in making a homebrew is barley. However, there are some other things that you can add. So you can add things like wheat. Uh, so some beers have a lot of wheat in them, beers such as Hefeweizens um, and other wheat beers. You can add corn. So, uh, and most corn that's used in brewing um, has, been, has been dried and, and what's called flaked. You can add rice. This is also something that's been dried and flaked. And these can add a little more uh, fermentable sugars. So we'll talk about the role of the sugars in a second. But they can also add some flavors. They can add some cloudiness. So um, certain types of lagers, for example, um, they have a lot of flaked corn in there, uh, Mexican lagers. And they give kind of a, a crisp, uh, almost corn kind of flavor to, it, to the beer. So in, before you can use the barley for brewing, the barley has to be what's called um, malted. And this, this, there are actually a number of maltsters in this area. There's, uh, there's a, a real big one up by New Paltz um, that, that does supp supply some grain to the area. So what malting means is that the barley is harvested by the farmer and it's soaked in water for about three to six days. And this is at about room temperature. And what this does is this simulates planting the barley, if you were to say grow a barley crop. And what that's going to do is it's going to activate enzymes in the barley that the barley would normally use to grow. So these enzymes are called amylases. And when these amylases are activated, then those amylases are what's gonna be used during the brewing process. And we'll talk about where in the brewing process this happens. But these amylases are what's going to be used to convert the starches to fermentable sugars. So if you took a piece of barley, um, and maybe you've, maybe you've had some barley, pearled barley, for example, if you chew on it, it's very starchy. It's full of starch. 
yeast can't break down starch. So these starches have to be converted to sugars. And that's the reason that these, the, the barley is, is germinated. It activates these enzymes. Now, I showed you in the previous slide that there, there are light grains such as these. There are some, some kind of slightly darker grains, um, some even darker ones, and some that are almost midnight black right here. And the difference between these grains is essentially how long they're kilned. So grains that after germination for about three to six days, they go into a kilning oven at about 85 degrees Celsius, which is about 180 or so degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that's for anywhere from a couple hours to almost a full day. And the longer they spend in the oven, the darker they become. And that is oftentimes where you see the difference in beers as far as the color goes. So for example, when you see light beers, such as Pilsners, uh, Hefeweizens, Cream Ales, anything that's really light in color, those tend to contain mostly malts that have only been killed for a couple of hours. Where beers that are really dark, such as porters or stouts or some types of dark, dark lagers, they tend to have a, a higher proportion of the darker kilned malts. And those, those provide color but they also provide flavor. So if you've ever had like a really roasty stout, that roasty flavor that you're getting from that stout is from the darker kilned malts because the kilning process gives it that kind of, uh, that, that, that toasty flavor. Now there, is, there are some misconceptions about things like light and dark beers. Um, it turns out that the color of the beer is not correlated whatsoever with the, the amount of alcohol in it. Um, you know, people, for example, I've had people tell me they don't like Guinness because it's just too heavy. Well, Guinness actually only has about four and a half percent alcohol. It's actually quite low. Um, the, the color of the beer has nothing to do with the alcohol. The, the percentage of the alcohol in the beer has everything to do with how much grain was actually used during the process. So as you increase the amount of malt that is in your, uh, that is in your, your brew, you're going to increase the amount of alcohol. And we'll talk about this when we get to the fermentation part, but essentially the yeast will convert about a certain percentage of all the sugars in there to alcohol. And these grains, these are providing the fermentable sugars that are used by the yeast to make ethanol. And I'll talk about that a little more when we talk about the actual process of brewing. So that's the role of grains in, in brewing. Um, there's also hops. So hops look like this. You've, you've probably seen, you may have seen pictures of hops before. These hops grow as vines. They grow really, really tall on sides of buildings, on, on large trellises. These hops, they, they grow as cones like this right here. And these hops provide a few different things to the beer. One is they provide bitterness, depending upon uh, how much of the hops you use and when you use them. They provide flavor, uh, particularly uh, some of the newer types of hops. And they also provide aroma. So whether you're, no matter what kind of beer you're drinking, even if it is a, you know, a Pilsner or, or a very light lager, there are, are, there are hops in that beer. Uh, any beer that doesn't have hops in it are too, would be too sweet to drink. You need to put something in there and, and hops are uh, now pretty much all that's used in beer. Um, there are a few beers where they use things like spruce tips and some other things, but almost all beers have hops to offset the sweetness that comes from the malt. And, the amount of hops that you add correlate with how sweet the beer is versus how bitter the beer is. So a, a beer that is kind of on the sweet side is generally due to not any particular grain, but due to the lack of hops. The, hop, the more hops you add, it adds a bitterness that actually kind of blocks the sweet flavor that you would taste in a particular beer. Um, and there are a lot of flavors that, that, and, and aromas that hops can provide. Um, when I first started brewing back in 2006, there were not a huge number of varieties of hops out there. There were probably you know, 20 or 30 different strains. Um, and this is, this is actually an older picture um, showing a handful of these strains and some of the different flavors that they provide. So some, some types of hops give more of a floral type of flavor. So these are um, oftentimes more of your, your uh, English or what's called noble hops. Um, sometimes, uh, and some of the similar ones give kind of more spicy flavors. Uh, some of them are kind of very, uh, are more evergreen. They're almost like, you almost have that kind of um, piney flavor to it. Uh, some give more of an earthy flavor. Uh, some give uh, kind of an herbal 
type of flavor. And most of the newer hops give more of the citrusy fruity flavors. So if you've had any uh, New England IPAs, for example, recently, uh, New England IPAs have a lot of newer hops that give these fruity and citrus flavors because those hops are nice because they cut down on the sweetness of the beer, but they also provide a nice flavor to, to the beer. And in fact, as of right now, there's, there's well over 100 hop varieties out there. Um, there. The nice thing about these hops is that you can get loads of information about them because um, the, these are, these are, people are always developing new strains of hops and they're, they're, they're always analyzing what are the different flavors that these hops provide. So we have grain, we have hops. Uh, my favorite is yeast because that's what I work on, but, but also because you, without the yeast, you can't do much. You know, the yeast are, uh, the yeast form a nice symbiotic relationship with the home brewer because essentially as a home brewer, you're providing sugar to the yeast. And that makes the yeast happy because the yeast uses that sugar to make energy, you know, just like we do in our body. It's a very, it's the same exact process um, that goes on in our body. But unlike us where we, we, uh, we will breathe out CO2, the way that we use yeast is that they're going to produce ethanol along with carbon dioxide. So ethanol is the, the alcohol that we find in beer. And the amount of ethanol that's produced by the yeast depends solely on how much sugar you're, you're giving them to ferment. And the CO2 is a byproduct that's, that's, that's used in the process as well. So this is what these yeasts look like. They're, they're, they're microscopic um, and they have been around for billions of years and we love to use them. Uh, that said, Not all brewing yeast is the same. Yes, this is this is an alt beer that I brewed. I'll, um, I'll talk about the different styles of beer in just a second. This is kind of a, uh, a hybrid ale lager style. So uh, not all yeast is the same though. There are a lot of different strains of yeast that are available out there. Um, this is actually uh, just, uh, this is some of the strains from just one company. Um, there, are, there are probably more strains of yeast than there are strains of hops out there now. Um, so it, it, might, it might look a little daunting, um, trying to figure out what, what strain of yeast you wanna use. Um, but the easiest way to think about the role of yeast in, in home brewing is that there's just two categories. You can break down all yeasts into ales, ale yeast and lager yeast. Ale yeasts are Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is actually the same species of yeast that you use in brewing in um, baking bread. So you probably don't want to use, uh, you don't wanna use baking yeast for brewing beer because those yeasts for brewing have been uh, cultivated to uh, not break down the same type of sugars, but they are the same species. They're very, very similar. Uh, lager yeast, there are different species of Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces pastorianus, and all beers, virtually all beers fall into these two categories. And you've probably seen some of these styles of beer before. So uh, for example, um, you know, a Pilsner, for example, um, an American light beer, uh, uh, Munich Helles, Doppelbach, these are all what are what we would call lager beers because these beers use lager yeast. And then we have things like porters, stouts, Belgian ales, uh, brown ales, pale ales, India pale ales. These are all ale yeasts. And there are a few that kind of fall in the middle here. So like, I'm, like I mentioned, the one I'm drinking that I made is it's called an alt beer. So it uses a, uh, it uses an ale yeast, but it ferments at lager temperature. But when you're when you're trying to, to decide what what yeast you want to use, basically it's all it all has to do with the style of beer. And these ale yeasts are, are oftentimes referred to as top fermenting yeasts, and the the lager the lager uh, strains are referred to as bottom fermenting uh, yeast strains. And the reason for that is the ale yeasts do tend to stay on the top of the fermenter. So on the left we have our our ale yeasts here. They do tend to sit on the top of the fermenter, uh, while the lager yeast tend to sit on the bottom. Um, that said, I, I, I didn't get a chance to, uh, to dig up a video of fermentation, but if you ever watch your, your beer as you're fermenting, um, it actually, the yeast are actually moving around so quickly in the fermenter, you can't tell if they're on the top or the bottom. It, look, it literally looks like a whirlpool in there. That's how, that, that is how active these yeasts get during the fermentation process. 
So the the ales, the the, the ale beers, they tend to have what are called um, kind of more fruity or estery flavors. So um, you know things like a hefeweizen, for example, where you have kind of more of that banana or clove flavor, for example. Well, lagers tend to give more crisp or sulfury flavors. So if you've ever had a, like a really cold lager and has that really crisp um, taste, or or if you've had maybe a Heineken and has a little bit of that sulfur flavor, that that all comes from the yeast. Um, now it turns out like even the lagers are the most common beer that that is sold in this country. Lagers have only been around since about the 1500s. We've actually been able to trace the origin of lager yeast. Ales have been around for thousands and thousands of years. So the ale beers are the ones that have been brewed, that have been brewed for um, you know since time immemorial. And how much flavor the yeast provides to the beer really depends upon the style of the beer and the type of yeast that you're using. So for example, if you're if you're making an India Pale Ale, you know, hoppy India Pale Ale, you're generally not going to get a whole lot of flavor from the yeast. But if you were to make something like a Hefeweizen, um, if you've ever had a Hefeweizen, you get that, you get those, those clove that maybe a little bit of pepper, a little bit of banana, that all comes from the yeast. Every single one of those flavors comes from the yeast. So it really depends upon the style of beer that you're making. But when you're trying to decide what type of yeast you want to use, there are some really great guides that will, will point out what are the best strains for the, the, the style of beer that you're trying to make. So we've talked about grains, talked about hops, we've talked about uh, yeast. Uh, the last is water. Um, the history of water and beer is actually quite interesting. Um, if you look at why certain styles are, are common in different parts of the world, you know, you think of, when you think of stouts, you think of Ireland, when you think of Pilsners, you think of Germany. Um, a lot of that has to do with the type of water that was present at those times in those specific areas in different parts of the, the, the world. Um, as a, as a beginning brewer, uh, water chemistry is generally something you don't really need to worry about. Um, as you advance on into brewing and you really, really want to get a particular style of beer perfect, um, at that point you might, you might look, a look, look at your water, chem water report and determine if there are some things that you might want to change about your, your water. But to be honest, I, I didn't look at water chemistry for the first many years of brewing and it really didn't, didn't impact my ability to make a good beer. So those are the four main ingredients. We have, we have malt, hops, yeast, and water. So let's talk about the process. So what do you need to start? If you wanted to start brewing, what do you need? Well, most brewers start with what's called extract brewing. And I'll talk about the difference between extract brewing and, and, and what's called all grain brewing in a minute. But if you wanted to start as an extract brewer, you, the things that you would need, you, you generally need a large pot. Um, the pot needs to be at least four gallons, but ideally seven and a half gallons or larger is best because most people make uh, batches of beer that are about five gallons. And for a five gallon batch, if you want to be able to boil the entire volume of your beer, which is ideal for making the best beer, you want to get, you want to, you want a, a pot that gives you a little bit of headspace between the top of the, the liquid and the top of the pot. Uh, you need a fermenter. So this is where the beer is going to ferment. We'll talk about the process of ferment, fermentation in just a minute. Um, this is typically either a glass or a plastic carboy or a bucket that looks like one of these buckets down here. And on the top of that bucket, you're gonna have what's called an airlock. And what the airlock does, it allows the carbon dioxide to escape while the fermentation is occurring, but it doesn't allow, it prevents anything from getting inside of the bucket. Um, you'll need some bottling equipment. So this includes a second bucket called a bottling bucket, some siphon tubing, so this is just plastic tubing, a bottle filler, uh, a bottle capper, which is this red item right here, some bottles, some bottle caps. Uh, you need a large spoon for stirring your, your beer, um, and you need some sanitizing solution. So I'll talk about sanitation uh, a little bit, but a uh, really big key to brewing is sanitation. And finally, you need a, a, both a hydrometer and a thermometer. A hydrometer measures specific gravity. So if you want to measure how much alcohol is in your beer, basically you're measuring how much sugar is in the beer before fermentation and how much sugar is in the beer after. And then you can calculate what the percentage of alcohol is. And a thermometer to make sure that you're, you're at the right temperature. So if you wanted to start with a kit like this, um, I'm not, I'm not a, this isn't a promotion for Northern Brewer. You can, you, you can get it from you know, many different um, 
many different sources. I recommend your local homebrew store. If you're in the area, there's a, there's a homebrew store called Pantano's in New Paltz, um, owned by Jerry, he's a good guy. Um, this kit, do, it doesn't come with the pot, comes with everything else, would run you about $90. So this is how I started. I started with a starter kit for about $90. Um, it also doesn't include, uh, some of these actually for $90, this includes your, the, the ingredients for your first recipe as well. So your, your initial investment is typically somewhere between $100, $150, depending upon the type of pot that you buy. So I'm gonna just go over a very broad overview of the process and then we'll go through the different steps. So we start with the barley and that gets malted, which we talked about, and then crushed. And then we mix that with water, and that's gonna form the sugars. We remove the grain from the water, because once we've converted the starches to the sugars, we don't need the grain anymore. At that point, you're gonna boil the, what's, at this point it's called the wort. So it, it's, it's pronounced wort. It's boiled for about 60 to 90 minutes. During that time, you're going to add the hops, and we can, we'll talk about you know, what point in that process is. You're gonna add the hops. After the boil, you're gonna cool down the, the wort. You're gonna add the yeast. There's a certain amount of time that's gonna be required for fermentation. And then finally, after fermentation is done, you can bottle your beer and it's good to go. So it's the process that a home brewer does is the exact same process that professional brewers are involved in. It's just on a smaller scale. Most if you ever talk to a professional brewer, um, I'm yet to meet a professional brewer who didn't start out as a home brewer. This is generally how people start. So let's talk about extract brewing. So let's say you were, if you were gonna start out uh, by doing what's called extract brewing, which most brewers do. And in the How to Brew book by John Palmer, he explains both the, the process of both extract brewing and what's called all grain brewing. So if you're gonna start out with extract brewing, which is how I started, uh, you're going to start with what's called malt extract. So instead of the greens, you're gonna start with either this, this very thick liquid or this powder here. And what this malt extract is, is it's the barley has been mashed. So what mashed means is the barley has been crushed because the, if you ever look at the barley, it's got a, a nice thick husk on it. So it's been crushed to open up the inside of the barley. And then it's soaked in water somewhere in the 150 to 154 degrees Fahrenheit range. And as a, as a scientist, brewing is the only place where I use uh, the, 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 the empirical system, but that's how brewers tend to do it. Um, it's the, the grain is soaked in 150 to 154 degree water for about an hour. And during that time, what's gonna happen is those enzymes that I talked about earlier, those, those uh, amylases, are going to convert all of the starches in those grains to sugars. So if you were to taste, if you were to, to mix the water with, the, with the, um, the grain and taste it right after you mix the water, it's gonna taste very starchy. It's gonna taste like a starchy, like a potato is starchy. If you wait an hour and then you taste it, it's gonna taste a lot more sweet. Um, it's not gonna be as sweet as say sugar sweet because what this is, the sugar that's, that is being converted in this grain is what's called maltose. So maltose is the sugar that is present in barley, and that's the sugar that the 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 yeast is ultimately going to be uh, is ultimately going to be breaking down. So you take this malt extract and you boil it in a kettle. Your this is your seven and a half gallon kettle for about sixty minutes, and you do usually do it in about six and a half seven gallons of water because there's going to be a certain amount of evaporation. Your final volume is going to be about five gallons for a typical home brew, and so this is a, a picture of, this is someone doing it uh, on their stove here. This is a, a large kettle. You can see this is at a pretty vigorous boil. And you can see this kind of green matter in the top of the, the, the kettle. And this, these are the hops. So during the 60 minutes, you're gonna add your hops. And how much and when you add it really depends on the style of the beer. But generally, if you add the, the hops early in the process, that's gonna add some bitterness to the beer. So uh, if you've ever had a really bitter, like a West Coast IPA, a lot of hops early on in the process. If you're adding it in the middle, around 30 minutes to 15 minutes, that's gonna add a lot of the flavor to the beer. So uh, certain, certain hoppy beers or even non-hoppy beers have some citrus flavors or some floral flavors. Those hops usually go in the middle. And then 
the hops that are added towards the end, that typically adds aroma. A lot of, a lot of beers have that kind of hop aroma. It's also during this time, during this boil, that you may add other flavorings, things like spices, uh, honey, chocolate, depending on the style of beer that you're gonna make. A lot of times these go in during the boil. And the nice thing about the boil is it's sterile. So anything that you put in, any, anything that you do before the boil, you don't have to worry about sanitation because the boil will kill anything. It's really only post-boil that you have to worry about sanitation. So this is what's happening during the boil, during the, the, the 60 minutes. Um, as I go through the process, I'm gonna mention a few things that um, I'm just gonna call them upgrades that you can do. Um, you, most of these things <clears throat> I did uh, relatively soon after starting my home brewing, but uh, some of them I, I waited a little longer. One of the first things I did actually invest in, because it, it was not a very large investment, was buying a propane burner. So you may have seen these, they're like turkey fryer burners. They're, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, these allow you to brew outside. And if you, if you have brewed before, if you ever have uh, gotten a boil over on your stove, the, the liquid that's in here is very full of sugar and it's very sticky. And it is very hard to clean off the stove. Um, so as soon as I started brewing outside, my wife was a lot happier about this. Um, so here, if I get a, if a boil over happens in the driveway, really doesn't matter. Um, and and also it 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 oftentimes allows you to heat up the the the, the beer a lot faster. And another thing that that you can invest in, especially if you have a large pot and if you if you are brewing outside, is what's called a wort chiller. And what this is is a copper coil right here, where water comes in one end here. Thank you for inside the beer and you run cold water through the coils and it's a heat exchanger is essentially what it is and it allows you to pull the beer down much quicker than say putting in a water bath so you can do this you can you can brew outside it gives you a little more flexibility and less mess in your beers um, another upgrade is if you wanted to do what's called all grain brewing so the process that I just talked about at the beginning of the boil with extract brewing is where you take your malt extract and you boil it up. What brewers, what, what professional brewers do and many home brewers do is do what's called all grain brewing. And this is another um, part that is actually a, not a very big investment and actually ends up being cheaper in the long run because the grain is cheaper than the malt extract. So to do this, you basically need what's called a mash ton. Um, and this is typically a cooler. It can be a, a rectangular cooler. It can be a, an igloo cooler like this. And inside the mash tun, you put, instead of the normal spigot, you put something like a, a stainless steel braid that has holes in it. Or you might put uh, what's called a false bottom. So it's kind of like a colander on the bottom. Or you might, this is, this is my mash tun here, um, you might put in uh, what's called a copper manifold, which is copper piping that has holes that are, that are slits in there. And what, all grain, what happens with all grain brewing is you put the grain, this is where you do the conversion yourself. You, you crush your grain, you put it in the cooler, and you mix it with the water, you wait the hour, and then you pull off the liquid instead of the, the maltsters doing that. And the nice thing about this, it really increases the variety of beers you can make and generally gives a better final product. Um, and it's a pretty inexpensive upgrade. The, the cooler, it's a you know, $20 cooler. I've been using the same cooler for 14 years, um, the same manifolds for 14 years. And it ultimately ends up being cheaper because the grain is a lot cheaper than the malt extract. So for all grain brewing, the only difference between all grain brewing and extract brewing is the very beginning. So instead of using the extract, you're just gonna start with the crushed grain. You're gonna mix it in the water for 60 minutes. And then you're going to drain the liquid from the cooler into the kettle. And then at this point, everything's the same. So you're gonna do your 60 minute boil with your hops. You're gonna add any of your additional uh, flavorings. Nothing is, nothing is different at this point. So the difference between extract brewing and all grain brewing is just this first part of the process before you get to the boil stage. So, We've boiled our, our wort for 60 minutes. We've added our hops. 
anything else we might want to add? What's the next step? Well, once the once the, the wort is done boiling, we have to cool it down. And this is a picture of a, a, a chiller inside a beer. And you can see there's, there's a, a hose attached to it running cold water through. So you need to cool this down to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So this can be done with a water bath or a wort chiller. Um, wort chiller is a good investment because this is where you really want to be as fast as possible. Once you get below 160 degrees Fahrenheit, you're below pasteurization temperature, other things can live in your beer. You wanna get your yeast in there as fast as possible because you want your yeast to outcompete anything else that might be in your beer. So generally, a wort chiller or a really efficient water bath is, is best here. Once you've got this down to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you're gonna transfer that wort into whatever your fermentation uh, vessel is. So this is typically either a glass or a plastic carboy or a bucket. So uh, I, I tend to prefer these carboys. Um, I, I actually prefer the glass carboys. They tend to scratch a little less. So you're gonna move your beer over here. Usually it's using a, a siphon of some sort. You're gonna oxygenate it. So that's usually just mixing it around really quickly because early on in the process, the yeast want oxygen because it helps them build up their cell walls. Um, after fermentation, you want to avoid oxygen, but here you really want to add oxygen to the beer. And then you put an airlock on top. But before you put that airlock, this is where you're going to add your yeast. So once you're at 70 degrees, you've oxygenated your, your wort, you're ready to add your yeast. I mentioned earlier, there are a number of diff different types of yeast, different strains. Um, they generally come in two types, dry yeast and liquid yeast. When I started brewing in 2006, there were very few good dry yeast strains out there. In fact, you, you almost had to use liquid yeast. And the downside of liquid yeast is uh, when you order it, there's generally not enough in there for your beer. So you have to make what's called a starter, which means you have to boil up some malt extract. You have to let the yeast grow up for a couple of days and then you're ready to go. The really nice thing about dry yeast is it's, it's good. You just add it to warm water for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then you can add it right to your beer. Nowadays, you can get a dry yeast for virtually any style of beer. So I, I really wouldn't recommend using uh, liquid yeast for, for anything unless you, there's something, a really specific style that you're interested in. I highly recommend dry yeast. You can just throw it in your fridge for a couple of years. It lasts, it's, it's foolproof, and it's relatively inexpensive. So, and that's your brew day. So your brew day, uh, typically lasts anywhere from two to four hours, depending upon if you're doing an extract and depending upon your homebrew setup. Um, you know, my from from when I start crushing my grain to when I put my fermenter in the basement, it's usually about three and a half hours for me, and then maybe a little bit of extra time for cleaning up. So at this point, you've added your yeast, you're ready to ferment, and this is what we call the primary fermentation. How long this takes and what temperature depends on, upon the style. So most ales ferment at about 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. There are a couple examples where they're a little cooler. Beers like Kolsch's or California Commons or an alt beer, they're gonna be a little cooler. Um, a Saison can actually get up to like 90 degrees, but most of your ales, most of your, your pale ales, your stouts, things like that, they wanna be in the 60 to 70 degree Fahrenheit range. So if you have a, a, a basement that's cooler, that's great. If not, you can, um, I, when I lived in North Carolina, it was, I didn't have a basement, it was really hot. I used to uh, keep it in a, a, a tub of water and just add ice for uh, every once in a while for a couple of days, and that worked fine. Um, lagers are a little trickier. So um, most, a lot of brewers are kind of scared of doing lagers. The brew day is the same for lagers. They're actually no different. The only difference with lagers is that you have to ferment them a little cooler. So primary fermentation for lagers is about 45 to 55 degrees and it takes a little longer. So while uh, ale fermentation is usually anywhere from like, you know, one to three weeks, lagers typically take about four weeks for, for primary fermentation. They take a little bit longer, the yeast is a little slower. And part of that is being cold, it's colder. And it's during this time that yeast is converting those sugars into ethanol and carbon dioxide. So this is where you're getting the, 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 the booze in your, in your beer. So this is our primary fermentation. Many beers don't need a second fermentation. So if you're making something like a Hefeweizen, a pale ale, a stout, porter, um, 
most uh, most ales don't need a primer, don't need anything after this. So at this point, you can go to bottling or kegging. But some beers do benefit from what's called a secondary fermentation, where you move the beer to a second carboy or bucket. And this is usually uh, uh, done using a siphon. And the reason that you might want to do this might be for uh, India Pale Ales, where you want to what's called dry hop the beer, which is add hops to give it a more hoppy aroma. Um, fruit beers, for example, if you've ever had like a blueberry ale or a, a, a you know, cherry ale, these fruits, you, you typically can't boil the fruit because it, it, it uh, gives off a lot of pectin. So with, the, with these fruit beers, you typically add the fruits to the secondary uh, fermenter. And lagers, even though it, lagers, they do take longer to ferment in primary, they do need to, after uh, primary fermentation, they need to, be, need to be what's called lagered, which is stored at about 34 degrees for four to eight weeks. So you typically need to move those to a secondary vessel to do that. So the total fermentation time depends on the style. Some beers like wheat beers or, or a mild, uh, you can turn these beers around in a week or two. They, they do ferment quite quickly and they don't need any aging. Most ales like pale ales, IPA stouts, they typically need about two to six weeks. Uh, lagers generally take on the order of three to six months. And that's mainly because they need that, that um, time to be in that lagering phase. So I have, a, I have a Yangling clone right now that's been lagering for about uh, seven weeks. So it's about ready to, to, to go on. And then uh, some really big beers, if you've ever had an Imperial Stout or a Barley Wine, um, these beers typically need anywhere from six months to a year to be ready to drink. And no matter what the beer, the actual fermentation is usually finished within three weeks. All the sugars have been fermented, but the higher the ABV and the more complex the beer, they generally need a little more aging. And the last step is going to be bottling. So once your fermentation and lagering is complete, you're ready to bottle your beer. Um, this is probably the most tedious part of the process, but it is necessary. So the way this works is you move your beer from your fermenter into that bottling bucket and you add a little bit of what's called corn sugar. It's very similar to table sugar. And what this does is it provides a little more sugar for the yeast to give off a little more CO2 in that capped bottle, which will carbonate the beer. So if you've ever had a what's called a bottle conditioned beer, it means that the beer is being carbonated in the bottle instead of in the, the fermentation vessel. And then it takes about one to two weeks at room temp to carbonate the beers. So, um, you know, most beers after that point, you're ready to drink them, but some require a little more aging. And that's, that's the end of the process. Um, there is one more upgrade I will mention. Um, bottling, it, it, it looks a little bit of a hassle. It, it is, a, uh, okay, good night. It is a little bit of a hassle. So one, another upgrade you can, you can do is um, a kegerator. So this is my kegerator in my basement. Um, it, it holds four homebrew kegs. So you, I've got my four, uh, my four faucets here. This is my CO2 tank, and this is the inside of it. So these kegs are five gallon homebrew kegs. So each one of these kegs um, holds one batch of beer. And while this was, this was a bit of an investment, um, it was completely worth it to me. I've had this, I've had this, this uh, kegerator for about 12 years now. Um, you don't have to worry about bottling. Um, it's a lot easier to clean, and it's really nice to just have a pint of your own homebrew uh, right out of the kegerator. And at that point, you're ready to drink it. It's it's that's that's your process. Um, before I take questions, I do want to give a couple. I was thinking about you know what are some things that I I wish I knew when I first started brewing, um, and this is always number one. Um, sanitation is really important. Like I said, nothing nothing harmful can live in your beer but a lot of things want to. So anything that touches your beer after the boil needs to be properly sanitized. So that means your fermenter, uh, any of your tubing, anything that touches the beer. Um, there are a lot of different sanitizers out there. Um, I won't use anything other than star sand because it's the best. It, it's it's you know, maybe a little bit more expensive, but it's by far the best. Um, but this is this is where most people run into issues is not uh, properly sanitizing their equipment. Um, another one is temperature for your fermentation is really important. Um, 
the temperature you ferment your beer can have a big effect on your final product. If you ferment a beer too warm, you can get a lot of off flavors. You end up stressing the yeast out. And stressed yeast give a lot of off flavors. So it, in the winter, most houses are fine um, for, for, for ales. Um, in the summer, a basement, or if you, get, you, you have a refrigerator that you can uh, put an external temperature controller on, that works awesome. Um, loggers, you, you do need a, a, a refrigerator to use for those loggers. Um, you know, a large kennel and a burner are, are a worthwhile investment. Um, being able to brew outside um, is incredibly nice. Uh, I, I'll brew outside in the worst of weather instead of inside just because you don't have to worry about making, making a mess. Um, the biggest, it, of all the things I talked about, kegging is the biggest investment. Um, you know, you can save money if you make your own kegerator, which is what I did. Um, but it's, to me, it was completely worth it. Um, and, you know, every once in a while, I'll even get a commercial, a commercial beer and throw it in the kegerator if I, if I don't have enough of my own, because you can do that. Um, it, it's really nice to be able to just pull a pint of your own homebrew from the kegerator. Um, take good notes. Uh, this, is, this is something that took me a little while to figure out, because I would, I would make an awesome beer, but then I wouldn't write down exactly what I did. And then it was hard to make it. So um, there are some good there are some good programs out there. I can I can uh, show you the one that I use in just a second that keeps where you can keep track of everything in the process, which is really nice. Um, when you start start with a simple style of beer, you know don't don't start with an imperial stout or you know a, a, a lager of some sort. Uh, my first beer I made was a, was a brown ale. It was it was good. You know it, it was good enough that I wanted to do it again. And then I think I did a. I did a stout and then a, a pale ale, um, but but most important, you know, just give it a try. Um, people have been brewing for thousands of years. It is not rocket science. It really isn't. It's it's half art and it's half science. The science is basically keeping good notes and good sanitation. The art is just wanting to try something fun. And you know, the last slide here um, from the great Charlie Papazian. There was a good article in the Smithsonian uh, this week about him, that's this link right here if you wanna take a look at it afterwards. Um, you know, he's one of the, 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 the legends in the, the homebrewing field and his saying is, you know, blacks, don't worry, just have a homebrew. Just give it a go, give it a try. Um, you're probably really gonna enjoy it. Um, so uh, I'll take questions in just a second. What I'll do is just show you real quick what, my, what, the, what the program is that I use for brewing. Uh, the program that I use uh, is, let's see, where are we here? Right here, it's called Beer Alchemy. This is, uh, I believe this is only on uh, a Mac, but there are similar programs on PCs. So this is, it says I have 134 beers in here, but I actually started using this after I started brewing. And it, and it, all, it sorts them by whichever beer. So uh, actually I'm, I'm gonna be brewing tomorrow and, um, what I'm going to try to do is, if anyone's interested, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, tape the important parts of the process. I'm going to borrow borrow a, a camera from somebody, and I'll I'll post it on my YouTube channel, and I can send that out to to anyone. If anyone wants to see what it looks like for you know someone like me to brew in my driveway, um, that's my plan tomorrow. So uh, I'll be brewing my uh, coconut porter tomorrow, because there was a request by a family member to make that again. So it keeps track of all the volumes, uh, the, the amount of grains that you use, the amount of hops, the, the beer that you use, or the, the yeast. And it also keeps track of what, you know, your, what your gravity was. So the gravity is the amount of sugar that you have before the, the brew and the amount of sugar you have after the brew. And this is how I keep my notes, is I, I have every beer that I make, I have, um, I have logged in this program right here. All right, so um, I would, love to take any questions that people have. Everybody feel free to unmute your mics and ask any questions you might have. Okay, I have a question. Yes. Uh, actually, I have two. Um, okay, great. You, you, you mentioned the risk of contamination during the oxygenation. So I was wondering, um, when you're doing the transfer, mm -hmm. is it important to shorten that time as much as possible or do you have some flexibility there? I mean, there's a little bit of flexibility. I think it, it, it does depend a little bit on what the process is that you're using to cool. So for example, if, if you don't have a work chiller, um, 
So when you're, when you're boiling the beer, you do need to make sure that you, you don't have a lid on it because the, the boil will drive off some of the, the off flavors, especially what's called uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, which is the kind of creamed corn flavor that you get in creamed corn. Um, it'll drive off those. Once you start cooling it, you can actually put the lid on it. And if you're using a water bath, you can, you can um, you know, keep cooling it down the water bath and the lid's gonna prevent anything from getting in. Um, if you're if you're using a wort chiller, typically it's open to allow the wort to uh, the, the 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 water to circulate around. So there is there is um, some leeway. It, it depends a little bit. If you're inside, there's less of a, a chance of contamination. If you're outside and it's really windy, you know, um, I'd say of all the times that I've had contamination, that's probably the place where it didn't occur most likely. Um, but what you what you don't want to do is just let it outside for like three hours after the boil. Because there are there are wild yeast that are floating around, and there are some wild bacteria that are floating around that have the ability to ferment sugar. Does that okay. answer your first question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then the um, the next question is: You mentioned uh, something about I thought you said that beer doesn't age, and I remember I went up to Magic Hat um, in Vermont and got myself uh, some of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Came home, I left them in the in the basement. I think maybe a month, and I got to tell you, that was some pretty sour, nasty stuff when I got the drink. Ooh. So okay. if it's, yeah, so um, so beer can get contaminated. I've, I've, had, I've had beer from breweries that are, that is contaminated. It won't make you sick, but it can certainly get contaminated. As far as aging beer, um, if it turns sour, then there was something wrong with it. Um, a, a beer, so, and, and how long you age a beer really depends upon the style. Like if you drink, if you're making a wheat beer, I wouldn't age that beer more than a few weeks because it, it's not going to, it's not going to go bad. It's just not going to taste as good. Uh, but certain beers like stouts, you know, I'll age them for, for months. Um, like I have, I have an Imperial stout in, in my fridge downstairs from two years ago that is, I'm actually giving it a little more time. I made a barley wine once that was uh, 10%. And uh, the last bottle I opened was five years after I brewed it, and it was still a really good beer. So it really does depend upon the style. Higher alcohol beers and dark beers tend to age much better than lighter beers and lower alcohol beers. Um, and part of the, the reason for that is the alcohol is, is a good preservative um, when it comes to not only the, uh, the, any sort of contamination, but also preserving the flavors. Dark beers also tend to have a lower pH which allows the beer to be preserved a little better. So aging beers actually, it's good. Aging beers is a great thing for, for higher alcohol beers and darker beers, but for, for things like um, lighter, lighter lagers and lower alcohol beers, generally isn't necessary. Okay, and then I wanna thank you for uh, doing this. It's pretty good. Oh yeah, my pleasure. So someone, someone asked in the chat, how much alcohol content do you like in, my home, in your home brews? That's a really good question because it really depends upon the style. Um, I'd say most of the beers that I make are in the 5% range. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the, the sweet spot of I can have a couple and still you know, be functional. Um, that said, I've made beers from uh, 3% to 12%. And it really kind of depends on, uh, you know, in, if I'm making, in my, it, this is the time of year I might think about making a, an Imperial Stout for January. You know, I make it about six months ahead of time. And if it's, cold and you know i want to have six ounces of an imperial stout that's 12 percent. that's great um i right now i also have right now i have um a what's called a grapefruit radler on tap which is a hefeweizen that i mixed with grapefruit juice so that's about three percent alcohol and so that's one where i can sit outside for a while and drink them and you know there's not a lot of booze in it so it really does depend upon the style of beer but most of the beers that i make are generally in the 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 four and a half to six percent range. Other questions? You're making me thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> I will let That's you know that. I don't um, have any beer, I finished it. <laughs> Magic Hat just recently sold their brewery up in um, Vermont and to another brewer zero something and they're actually moving to rochester mm -hmm. they're moving their production to rochester new york yep yep yeah there's wow. it's it's really hard to keep track of um breweries are being bought and sold all the time 
Um, I tend to really try to support the local breweries and um, sometimes you, you, t you don't notice and the local breweries are now owned by the larger breweries. But uh, in this area, there are a lot of uh, still you know, independently owned breweries. And I always, I mean, I, I, I always have beer on tap, but I'm, I'm always trying to try out new beers that the local breweries have. So I'm always trying to support a lot of the local ones. So are there many, many different types of hops? Yeah, I mean, as far, there, there are probably over a hundred strains of hops in terms of types. Um, you know, I, I showed that flavor wheel that you can have citrus, you can have um, you know, floral, um, but you, hops are also oftentimes kind of broken apart by what's called the, the uh, percentage of alpha acids in the hops. So the higher the alpha acids, the more bitter they are. So certain hops um, are uh, what are called high alpha acid hops. These are oftentimes used in really um, bitter, bitter uh, IPAs. And then there are ones that are really low alpha acid hops. These are what are called like your noble hops. Uh, these are ones that are used in pilsners and lagers in English pale ales. So, uh, you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're looking at the contribution of hops to the beer, it's not only the amount of hops that you're using, but it's how potent those hops are. Um, a lot of the new hops, there are a lot of new hops. If, if, you, if you follow any of the, the New England IPAs, there are a lot of new ones. Uh, Citra, Galaxy, Idaho 7, um, you know, Motawaka. Like, I can't even keep track of them all anymore. And though, most of those are, um, are, are actually hybrids of multiple strains of hops where they are trying to get very specific uh, flavors. And most of the hop varieties now are moving away from the real bitter flavors and into more versatile flavors where they're very, uh, they're kind of tropical or citrusy. Thank you. That's good. Mm -hmm. So, who else is drinking your beer? <laughs> um, I, 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 my wife drinks it. Um, I, I do give it away to uh, some some of my my uh, neighbors. I, I've been. I live. I live across the bridge in Beacon, so I, I have a little little bit of a bike service where I'll uh, deliver growlers to to friends when I have uh, when I have excess beer. But it tends not to stick around too long. Uh, no. Especially now that I'm home all the time. Do you sell your beer? I don't sell my beer. No. I don't. I don't want AT, ATF uh, coming after me. Oh, ATF. Okay. Or whoever, whichever the agency is. Oh. I, I'm I'm happy to give it away, but I I, I don't sell it. Okay. Yeah. I I people have asked me if I if I want to open a brewery, and I don't. Um, I really enjoy home brewing, and I know a lot of I, I have a lot of people I know who are professional brewers. It's a lot different when you have to do it for a job. Um, for me, like tomorrow, I'm gonna go out probably you know four or five in the afternoon. I'm gonna go outside, set up my my brewing equipment, put on some music, and I'm just gonna enjoy brewing. And if it doesn't work, it's not a problem. Like there's not much riding on it. If it doesn't come out the way I want, that's fine. I'll still drink it. Uh, but if I was doing it for a job, uh, it's it, it, there's a lot more pressure. Any other questions? Thank you all so much for coming and thank you, um, Evan, so much for doing this. This is very um, interesting and uh, it was great. I hope, thank you all and thank you, Evan. I oh, hope you had, oh, yeah. and Margaret and I also live in Beacon, so we're gonna ride around and try to find <laughs> 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 you see, you see a guy on a gray bike in a backpack. Uh, that's that might be me with a growler back there. There you go. Uh, I wish I lived in Beacon. I'm in Washington State. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> there are some good, good breweries out there. There's some uh, yeah. really good breweries yeah. out here. Yeah. So yeah. So like I said, um, when I when I brew tomorrow, um, what I'll do is I'm going to record it and I'll, I'll post it on on YouTube, and I'll I'll send the link to Michelle and she can send it out to anyone who who wants it'll. Um, I'll kind of walk people through the process as I'm doing it. Um, you, I'm sure you can find some, you can find some, uh, uh, some examples online, but um, it'll give you an idea. My, my, my setup is, and, and I, I do recommend uh, the last slide, if you read Charlie, the, the article about Charlie Papazian. He's been brewing for you know, 30, 40 years, however long. He's got the same setup he had 30, 40 years ago, and I'm kind of the same way. Um, I've got the same 
literally the same mash tun. I've got the same uh, boiling pot that I've had for uh, 14 years. And it works, you know, it's nothing fancy, but it makes some, it makes some really good beer. And that's really all that matters to me. So you, know, you, can, you can spend thousands of dollars in this hobby, but you don't have to. You can do it pretty cheap. And when I first started brewing, um, so when I first started brewing, I, uh, it, was, it was actually about the same price to brew beer as it is to buy beer, or it was to buy beer. Um, the cost of craft beer has skyrocketed in the last five years. So I can actually do it for about half the price as I can to buy the same beer. So it's actually, for a hobby, you know, if I'm buying less beer, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm making some of that money back. <laughs> so yeah, people ask, uh, can, can you get access to your PowerPoint, my PowerPoint slides? Absolutely. Um, I can have uh, Michelle send those out to you guys. You're yep. absolutely oh, great. welcome to have them. I was gonna ask that, so good. Thank yeah, you. if you guys wanna, if you would like to have me send it to you, you can just email me at alumni at msmc.edu. It goes right to me. And and please, if you if you have any quite if you if you you know want to get into start uh, brewing or even if you're just thinking about it, um, feel free to email me. Um, I'm always happy to to answer any questions. Um, you know, I love I love getting people into this hobby. I will I will warn people. Um, I have gotten people into this hobby who have gone to work in breweries and they're wives were not so happy about it um but you know <laughs> that's that's the risk you take um so yeah you know i've got i've gotten some people very very deep into this hobby but uh, it is a lot of fun sounds like it thank you so much yeah so my pleasure okay, thanks everybody great job yep. thank you all right bye thanks bye. for coming everyone thank you all so much have a great night and enjoy the weather this weekend it's supposed to be beautiful Yep. And for all you dads, happy Father's Day. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evan.